Hello, this is Domenico with Easynomics, and we're going to do one last video on illustrating contractionary monetary policy with the Keynesian model as opposed to the Montrose model. We're going to use the same example that we used uh, on contractionary monetary policy um, with the Montrose model. So uh, we we saw before, but I'll explain again that in the uh, on the um, as a result of the September 11th terrorist attack. The Central Bank of the United States, the Federal Reserve Bank, immediately intervened by lowering interest rates, which we can see here. Interest rates were above 6%, and then they were lowered below 2%. That was meant to encourage aggregate demand to allow households and firms to borrow cheaply and spend into the economy to avoid a deep recession. But we can see that, unfortunately, that expansionary monetary policy kept interest rates perhaps too low for too long, from 2002 to 2004. And those low interest rates led to households and firms borrowing and spending into the economy, in this case, on buying uh, apartments, housing, brand new housing, which is part of investment spending. And we see that the aggregate demand is rising and boosting housing prices uh, in the years before 2005. So with that data, the Federal Reserve Bank of the Central Bank quickly tried to slow <clears throat> tried to slow down that uh, borrowing and spending by raising interest rates from below 2% up to about, let's say, you know, somewhere over 5%. And that's what we call contractionary monetary policy. So that's what we're going to illustrate. So again, we have um, two graphs illustrating demand-side policy, specifically monetary policy. That's the role of the central bank to influence the supply of money to impact uh, the rate of interest. In graph A, we have a money market graph. We're measuring the quantity of money on the x-axis and the rate of interest on the y-axis. We have a downward sloping demand for money curve labeled DM1 with a perfectly inelastic supply of money curve labeled SM1, where SM1 equals DM1 at point A, it provides an equilibrium rate of interest at IR1 or at 1.75% as a result of that expansionary monetary policy from 2002 to 2004, and an equilibrium quantity supply and demand for money at QM1. In graph B, we're illustrating a Keynesian model. We're measuring real GDP on the x-axis and the price level on the y-axis. We have the Keynesian aggregate supply curve with its horizontal section, section one, where we're assuming uh, a kind of price floor as a result of labor contracts, minimum wage legislation, worker or union resistance to wage cuts, employer resistance to cutting wages that sets that horizontal price level. Then we have section two, where we're getting to full employment, we're fully employing our uh, factors of production. And in section three, we don't get much, we don't get any increase in output, but just an increase in the price level. We have a downward sloping aggregate demand curve labeled 81, and where 81 intersects the Keynesian aggregate supply curve at point A, provides a price level or a degree of inflation at PL1, and uh, full potential GDP at YP. And we're going to assume that at that point, the United States was at its long run level of unemployment, its long run average level of unemployment of about 5%. Okay? So the low interest rate of 1.75% from 2002 to 2004 led to increased aggregate demand. We're going to remember that aggregate demand equals consumption plus investment plus government plus exports minus imports, all of that spending. And households and firms were taking advantage of the low interest rates, borrowing and spending into the economy. So we saw consumption spending rising and investment spending rising. And that causes aggregate demand to increase from 81 to, let's say, about 82. Nope. To 82. We're going to exaggerate this a bit. Okay. So we go from 81 to 82. And that increases the price level, as we saw with the housing price index. Housing price is really taking off. Okay, and the price level rising from PL1 to PL2. We're really exaggerating um, the increase in the price level. And because of that increase in aggregate demand, 
uh, firms are trying to increase their quantity of aggregate supply along the Keynesian aggregate supply curve, and they're doing that by employing more factors of production uh, like labor. So labor is being further employed and unemployment is falling. And we see real GDP increasing. So let's go ahead and, and exaggerate. Well, we can't really exaggerate that. So real GDP increases from YP to Y inflation. Y inflation, if you can read that. And unemployment falling to about, let's say, 3%. Okay? So the central bank sees the data that unemployment is falling below its natural rate or its long run average. That's a signal that the economy is entering an inflationary gap. And we see some data, in, in this case, the house, housing price index, illustrating that there's an increase in the price level from PL1, a uh, high degree of demand pull inflation. So the central bank thus sees that we're entering an inflationary gap and they want to reduce aggregate demand. And they're gonna do that by contracting the supply of money from SM1 to SM2. So it decreases from SM1 to SM2, and they're doing this by selling government bonds back to central the central government and to other investors. And when they sell those bonds, they are then getting paid in U.S. dollars. So they're contracting that money out of circulation, and thus the supply of money has decreased from SM1 to SM2. That creates a new equilibrium from point A to point B. It reduces the quantity supply and demanded for money from QM1 to QM2 and raises the interest rate from IR1 to IR2 to let's say about to about 5%. So the higher interest rate causes Households to borrow less, firms to borrow less, and spend less into the economy. So the consumption spending is falling, the investment spending is falling, and thus aggregate demand is decreasing from 82 to 81, going back to full potential. Now that was the goal. Unfortunately, uh, the 2007-2008 economic crisis uh, led to aggregate demand falling straight into a recessionary gap. So the Federal Reserve or the Central Bank was you know, too late, perhaps, in raising interest rates to um, lessen the impact of the severe economic downturn of the 2008 economic crisis. Okay? So that's the idea behind contraction monetary policy to uh, eliminate or close an inflationary gap. So let's go ahead and analyze this as we would for an IB paper exam. As can be seen, we have two graphs. Graph A is a money market graph. Graph B is a Keynesian model that, uh, where we're illustrating uh, an inflationary gap, and we're going to use contractionary monetary policy to close that inflationary gap. In graph A, we're measuring the quantity of money on the x-axis, the rate of interest on the y-axis. We have a downward sloping demand for money curve labeled DM1 and two perfectly inelastic supply of money curves labeled SM1 and SM2 where SM1 equals DM1 at point A, provides an equilibrium rate of interest at IR1, and equilibrium quantity supply and demanded for money at QM1. And we're gonna assume that that rate of interest was at 1.75%. In graph B, we have a Keynesian aggregate supply curve, a horizontal section, where we are assuming that labor contracts, minimum wage legislation, work and union resistance to wage cuts, employer resistance to um, cutting wages to uh, lower morale and productivity. Uh, that's leading to a kind of price floor in the price level. Then we have section two where we're fully employing our factors of production, reaching full potential GDP. And then section three, which is a vertical section where we don't get more output because all of our resources are fully employed. We just get a, uh, a rising price level as AD shifts out. We have two downward sloping demand curves or aggregate demand curves, they hold 81 and 82. And where 81 equals the Keynesian aggregate supply curve at point A, it provides a price level at PL1. 
and uh, real GDP at YP. We're going to assume that at YP, the U.S. economy is at full employment or the natural rate of unemployment, which is about 5%. Due to the low interest rates as a result of expansionary monetary policy, um, that incentivizes firms and households to borrow money since it is so, so cheap to borrow at 1.75% um, and spend into the economy. So consumption, consumption spending rises, investment spending rises, and aggregate demand begins to increase from 81 to 82. And that creates a new equilibrium where 82 equals the Keynesian aggregate supply curve at point B, increasing the price level from PL1 to PL2, and increasing marginally uh, real GDP from YP to Y inflation. Uh, firms are trying to increase the quantity of their aggregate supply from point A to point B to meet the increased aggregate demand, and they begin to employ uh, the last remaining units of labor. People who were structurally unemployed are now employed. People who are not, might have been friction unemployed now employed. And so the unemployment rate falls from 5% to 3%. And we see an increase in the price level as indicated by the house price index. So that data of unemployment being less than the long run average and the housing sector prices rising uh, illustrating the rise in the price level indicates that we've entered an inflationary gap, too much demand pull inflation, and the central bank intervenes uh, willing, wanting to reduce aggregate demand. And they do that through contraction, contractionary monetary policy or tightening monetary policy. They are selling government bonds back to the central government and to other investors and withdrawing the supply of money. As a result, from SM1 to SM2, where SM2 equals DM1 at point B, it raises the rate of interest from IR1 to IR2 or from 1.75% to 5% and reduces the quantity supplied and demanded for money from QM to QM2. Because money is more expensive to borrow, households and firms are borrowing less, spending less into the economy, and thus aggregate demand falls from 82 back to 81, uh, thus closing the inflationary gap and returning to full potential GDP. And that's it. If you have any questions, feel free to comment and don't forget to like and subscribe. Thank you so much.